Hello everyone, welcome to the Office Pal Thought Leaders webinar. I'm Dilip Andra, founder and CEO of Office Pal. Office Pal's mission is to provide tools that enable admin professionals worldwide to be more productive and successful. As a part of this mission, we've been conducting webinars with various industry leaders and experts that are relevant to the administration and office management space. Today, we have Joan Berg, author, master trainer, and founder of Office Dynamics International joining us via a video conference. Many of you have already met Joan uh, virtually via our previous webinar in December on admin superstars. That webinar was a huge success with over 1,000 participants, and over 500 of you have viewed the video replay so far. Looks like we're having another uh, full house event today. We had over 1,400 registrations for this event. We seem to be already over capacity. Thank you all for your participation. Hi, Joan. Welcome back to the Office Path Art Leaders webinar. Hi, Dalip. I'm so excited to be back. Great to see you. Great. So, uh, yeah, so before uh, I get started, uh, you know, quick housekeeping item. Uh, I think most of you are aware about WebEx interface. Uh, please note the audio is muted for all of you, all the participants, all the audience, so you can submit questions using the WebEx interface. So please feel free to uh, add your questions and uh, we'll try possible towards the end. And if there are any questions left unanswered, perhaps, uh, you know, Joan will take them uh, via office file or via email. So, okay, let's get started. Uh, Joan, uh, for the benefit of uh, office file community members, uh, you know, who are seeing you for the first time and who might have probably not attended the previous webinar with you, can you please share your uh, background? Yes, I'd be happy to, Delete. So, Office Dynamics International, we are the leader in the development and presentation of sophisticated training programs and information for administrative office professionals. And we've been doing this for a very long time, since 1990. Um, I actually was one of the first to create in-depth training for administrative office professionals. We offer an array of programs and products ranging from our World Science Assistant High-End Boot Camp to an annual conference for uh, to on-site training, online learning, nearly 1,000 blog posts, free educational videos. So we really cover the whole gamut. Um, I also work with executives and assistants and do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I think what's really important, though, to share is that before I started Office Dynamics in 1990, I worked in the administrative work. Uh, profession for 20 years in 12 different companies in five states. I started out as receptionist and worked my way up to uh, executive assistant level working for CEO. So I can bring a lot of value and really help assistants. I've been in their position uh, for 20 years, and I've also been on the other side of the desk, being an executive for 23 years, so I can share both perspectives, which is very helpful for them. That's fantastic. So your background definitely uh, seems quite impressive, uh, you know, both as a practitioner and as a trainer and as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, who's employing the administrative professional. You seem to have played all these different roles as well. And so you also authored some very interesting books. Can you talk uh, maybe a couple of minutes about that as well? Oh, yeah, certainly. Uh, so we have three cutting-edge books for administrative professionals. Uh, Become an Inner Circle Assistant was my first really in-depth book I wrote for assistants, and that covers the 12 core competencies that are critical to being a star in the profession today. And then I wrote underneath it all, and that book covers the advanced competencies. So I teach assistants how to manage their careers, how to be more persuasive, how to earn their rightful place on the executive team in that book. And then our latest book, which I absolutely love, is Who Took My Pen Again? And I love that book because it was a demonstration of collaboration among administrative peers. We had 240 attendees at our annual conference for administrative excellence. We provided some tips for the foundation of that book. 
And then Jasmine Freeman, Nancy Graves, and myself built out all the chapters uh, in that book. And it's very future-based in terms of the competencies and systems will need to be very successful in the future. So those are the three core books that we have. And then I have several other business books, too, for executive and administrative professionals. Right. That's great. So, uh, so now let's dive right into the topic. So, so what is your definition of self-leadership and why is it important for assistants to master self-leadership? Self-leadership. So in a way, it almost sounds self-explanatory, doesn't it? Lead yourself. But what do I really mean by that? And what I mean is it's about accountability, being 100% accountable. It's being responsible um, for the good decisions and the bad decision, the decisions you make. Uh, Self-leadership is really looking at your day and what are you going to lead in. So taking the lead in managing my task today. It's taking the lead in managing my attitude. It's taking the lead in managing my stress for that day. It's taking the lead um, in how I approach my work, how I approach people. I take the lead in how I want to effectively communicate with you and others. I take the lead in creating win-win situations. Self-leadership, you're not waiting around for others to make decisions. You're not waiting for others to tell you what to do and how to do it. I mean, you own it. And you take 100% responsibility. So the good news is that is something we can control all day long. Uh, the good news is you don't sit and wait again for everyone to give your direction or tell you it's okay. That doesn't mean you still don't have to get direction from your executive and such. But I also see where assistants can go much farther than they do. They tend to wait for their executive to tell them the next step or tell them the next process or tell them how they should make this next phone call. So it's up to the assistant to say, I'm going to take the lead on this. I'm going to be that leader. And something really interesting with self-leadership is it's making unpopular decisions. Self-leadership is not following the crowd. And so maybe you're not always going to be popular, but you are doing what you know is right, what you know is best. And I'll give you a really simple example of that, Billy. What I see often in the workplace with our very casual work environments today. Mm -hmm. so I'll often hear assistants say to me, because I teach professional dress and image, is what everyone else comes in with their tennis shoes and jeans on Friday, so I have to do that. I'm like, no, you don't. What is the image you want to project? How do you want to be perceived? So it isn't that you have to come in with a formal business suit, but I might say I'm going to wear, you know, uh, loafers instead of tennis shoes. I'm going to have a really sharp blouse on or top on. I'm not going to wear just a, a T-shirt that I would wear to the gym. So that's a simple example, but it just shows you how even as adults, people are afraid to self-lead. So mm -hmm. self-leadership takes courage. Um, it takes doing, like I said, what's right for you. The benefits of self-leadership are you enhance your ability to control all the chaos around you throughout the day. So I know from being in the trenches as an assistant, I know as a CEO and running a company that we don't even have enough hours in the day to do all we have to do. I know it's really important to have that self-leadership so you can control what's happening throughout the day. And I shouldn't say that because we really can't control what happens, but we can control how we approach it. We can control where we choose to put our focus at this moment. As an assistant, you can control the A priorities, the B priorities. You have to know how to establish those. You also multiply your value in the workplace. When you self-lead, you really increase your value. Management looks at you in a whole new way. You gain respect. You bring, gain credibility. Um, I love that you're not a victim. You know, a lot of people out there, assistants, sometimes feel like they're kind of a victim of the circumstances and everything that's happening around them. But when you self-lead, you don't feel like a victim at all. You feel like a victor. Uh, you live each day with a tent. 
you're, you're, and actually what's great is you become a role model for others. So while I'm not talking about how to lead others in their system, but when you self-lead, when you manage your attitude, when you manage how you respond to something, and you're not reactive, but you are proactive, people notice that. People watch that. And what happens, you actually encourage them. You inspire excellence in those others, you know, the others around you. Mm. So those are just, you know, some of the ideas. I hope that helps and I do those a good explanation. Excellent. No, I mean, those are, you know, I mean, great self-leadership principles, not just for assistants. I'm sure even for executives and uh, entrepreneurs, too. I mean, uh, you know, definitely those are really some solid principles. And I, you know, my takeaways from what you just said is really stop blaming yourself and blaming others and take responsibility, right? Uh, you know, responsibility is never given and, and, and be willing to be that self-leader, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so now how does one go about mastering this self-leadership? That's a really good question because you have to, first of all, it starts with the mindset. To me, if you don't have the mindset, the actions are not going to follow. You have to say in your mind, tell yourself, this is the right thing to do. This not only is going to make my life easier and a lot less stressful, but I'm actually going to have a positive domino effect on all those around me. And that's what assistants want to do. That's what they love to do. Uh, So it starts in your thinking. You have to say, I am a leader of myself. I can have control even when there's chaos going around me. And then you have to own it. You have to 100% own it. Not put the blame on anyone, not put the blame on any circumstances. Well, okay, yeah, I'm having a bad day. I'll give you a perfect example. Monday, I had a horrific morning, and I was supposed to be in the studio taping all day. In fact, this whole week, I'm doing videotapes and educational programs. Monday morning, I was not having a good morning. I needed to get to the office, and I got in my car, and the battery was dead. That is not the frame of mind I want to be on when I have to go into a studio and I have to be at the top of my game. And I was really agitated at first. But, you know, I took the self-leadership. I got control of my attitude. I put my mind in the right place. And I ended up having a good day and a successful successful recording session. So um, we have to, like I said, kind of own it. We have to recognize when we are going down the wrong path during the day in our thinking, and then you have to stop it and say, okay, I don't want to go down this path. I don't want to let my attitude slip because if I do, that's going to affect my productivity. It's going to affect my relationship. So now I'm going to own it. I'm going to take control of it, and I'm going to put myself on a positive path. So, I know it's not a lot of tips I'm giving you because it isn't really a lot of tips. Mm -hmm. It's your thinking. And as soon as a person changes their thinking and saying, I am going to self-lead, their life changes immensely, not only at work, but at home. And we impact our families and we impact our financial life. We impact all the pillars of our life, which I, I know I talked about the five pillars before. Um, and you've just got to keep practicing it. And when you fall off and you, you're not quite leading yourself, you need to say, okay, I'm getting back on track and I'm going to move forward. And you just get better and better at it. And it just all of a sudden becomes a part of you. And you feel so good about it. You just want to have it every single day. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, definitely those are some very interesting examples. So, uh, so clearly, you know, uh, what you're saying is start with the right intention and bring that shift in mindset and be determined to become uh, a strong self-leader. You know, one of the challenges, Joan, is assistants are often working on really critical deadlines and they face a lot of stress, right? Uh, imagine, like, the stress you face on Monday morning. So they probably face that every day in their work life. How do you think assistants can apply these techniques to overcome stress in their life? You know, I love administrative professionals. 
and they have so much on their plate. And I see this. One, I know it has been assistant for 20 years, but also there's something special I do in my work, and that's on-site coaching. Really. I'll answer your question very shortly. But, and I just had a project last week here in town. And when I go on site and work with an assistant, I sit at that assistant's desk for two full days and I watch every single thing they do, every single thing they have to touch. I see their interactions with their executives. I look at all their emails that they have to manage. I'm, I'm right in there with them. And I'm amazed, you know, when I leave and I look at the volume of work, it isn't just the variety and the diversity, it's the volume. The average number of emails assistants manage today are 225 every day. And on the high side, 400. So what do they do? What do you do? It's called self-management. For years, we were taught stress management. I went to all kinds of programs on managing stress. Um, and I also teach this. And so the thing is, it's really about managing ourselves. It goes back to our thinking. So in other words, if I'm, if I'm thinking about all these things that I have to get done in a very short time, and let's say I'm, I'm going to go off and I'm going to go out by the mountains actually and relax and chill out and not worry about it so I can relieve my stress. But I'm not in the mountains by Red Rock here where we live, and my mind's still going 100 miles an hour. It doesn't matter that I remove myself from all this craziness. That's where it takes place in your brain. So I could be sitting here in my office being overwhelmed, being overtasked, feeling overworked, but in my thinking, I'm going to manage what I'm thinking about. So for assistance, instead of, in other words, thinking about, I have to have this report done by 4 o'clock today, I have to make these new reservations for my executive today, I have to have this PowerPoint presentation ready today. And you think about all this stuff, and so then you get worked up and you feel so overwhelmed. You think, you kind of say, okay, I know what I have to do today, and now I'm going to manage my thinking about that and tell myself I will get this done. I know I will get this done because I'm a great assistant. I'm going to prioritize. I'm going to step back. I'm going to think about what I have to finish today, and you really think about what is the impact if you don't get it done today, because we also give a false sense of urgency in our business world today. So for the assistance, it's self-management, changing your thinking. Another good example, let's say that there's someone in the office that has upset you. Now, you're thinking about how upset this person has gotten, and you're just, oh, you really don't like this person and working with them, and they just don't get it. Well, the more you think about it, the more stressed you get, the more upset you get. So at that moment, you want to self-lead. You want to stop that thinking because you don't want to go down that negative path, and now you're going to manage you're thinking about, okay, yes, I don't really like how that person operates, but I can't change them. I can't control them. So how am I going to communicate with them? Because we have a project. So do you see, it, it goes, it's, a lot of this goes back to your thinking, Billy, and our thinking is so powerful. Yes. Yeah. So it's about so self-management, self not get away from the stress man. We want to move from stress management which is more of what we learned for so many years, and think self-management. And that's good news because we realize we have the control. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, so talking about thinking, you know, definitely there are two styles or two types of thinking, right? You know, you can do linear thinking and sometimes non-linear thinking. And solving day-to-day -day problems and overcoming stress often requires a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. So how do some of these self-management techniques uh, uh, help uh, develop creative thinking ability? Well, with our thinking abilities um, and self-managing, it's also self-managing in a way that you get into free flow thinking. Now, that's kind of interesting because that sounds like an oxymoron. Why would you say that? You're telling me to think, but don't think. So what I mean by that is we want to access our creativity. Uh, yes, assistants are expected 
to problem solve today. They are expected to come up with solutions and ideas and even create new processes and new ways of doing things. So we want to access our creative muscle. What's interesting, so many people say, I'm not creative. I have assistants tell me that all the time. I'm not creative. But that's because we're thinking of creative being artistic. We think of artists or graphic designers or photographers or musicians being creative. But I have proven that we're all creative because in one of the workshops I do, I ask all the assistants to bring something to that workshop that represents creativity to them. You know, something that they've done that represents their creativity. Every time they walk in with something, whether it's uh, how they put their daughter's wedding together or a dress that they made that they could sew. So everyone has creativity. We just express it in different ways. So in terms of managing that, what I want to suggest is that we step back, actually. Um, let, your, let your mind flow. Uh, we get very rigid sometimes, and we get into judging our thoughts. So maybe we have an idea of how to solve a problem or work with something, but then we judge it right away. And instead, we want to access right brain brain thinking. That's the free, intuitive flow. And that usually comes uh, naturally and feels really good. So assistants have to give themselves more time throughout their day to, to allow that to happen. Or if they're facing a problem and they can't figure it out, you put it on the back, what I call the back burner. And, um, but you always keep a question mark in your mind. Like, well, what is the answer to that? Well, how can I make this better? How can I streamline this process? How can I make my executive's life easier? How could I take the stress off my, you know, off my back? And so what you do is you put the question mark in your subconscious and you just then go about your day, whether it's at home or at work. What's really interesting is when you least expect it, your subconscious kicks in and the answers rise up. So you're not forcing it. You're, in a way, you're self-managing because you're giving yourself permission to just let, let thoughts float. Let them, you know, come to you instead of forcing it all the time. Um, if we don't put a question mark in our mind and it, instead we think, well, that's it. There's no better way. I can't do anything else about it. That's just the way this is. Then your subconscious is going to look for new answers. In fact, I was just in a situation last week where I was at this office, you know, that I was telling you about in town, and one of the uh, directors came in and was talking about an issue he was having, and he can't do this training at work because he's always getting interrupted, and, and that, therefore he wants to go off site. Well, budgets would not allow him to do that, and I was in that conversation, and I said, so what are you going to do about it? If you have to stay here and you have to do this learning at your facilities, what are you going to do about it? Instead, that person was just accepting that, oh, well, that's the way it is. I can't do anything about it. So, again, going back to kind of pull this together for assistance is don't be really judgmental. Don't be hard on yourself when you can't figure it out. Just have a quest. Keep the question mark in your mind and trust and know your answer will rise up. And, yes, every once in a while, do some just fun, creative experience. Uh, activities, maybe get together with your administrative peers, go into a meeting room for a half hour, let your ideas just flow and share thoughts with each other and brainstorm. Uh, we use a lot of creative props in our training really, to spur creativity uh, mm -hmm. with our attendees. So that's another thing. Don't be afraid to bring in some props and have some fun and stimulate that. Right. So, yeah, I love that, uh, you know, the metaphor about uh, creative muscle. And so if you don't exercise like any other muscle, you lose it, right? <laughs> and you need to constantly strengthen it by exercising the creative muscle. That's a very interesting point. So, so one of the things about, uh, you know, being a strong leader, John, is uh, you need to be able to set expectations and meet expectations. And, and some of these expectations, you know, you're setting both in your interactions and verbally, and some of the expectations are also set based on what kind of professional brand you've established, right? So, so how should, you know, one master self-leadership to develop their professional brand? 
Oh, uh, I'm so glad you brought this up. This is a really, this is a topic I'm very passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, branding yourself. So today it is all about establishing your brand. For years and years, we were talked to and taught about professional image. I even taught that for years. The last several years, it's all about establishing a brand for yourself. So what do I mean by that? So I want your audience uh, or audience, I'm talking to you. So what I'd like you all to do is think about your company right now. Think about your company's logo. Okay, can you picture the colors, the font? What does it look like? What does your company's brand communicate? Will your employer, your organization, spend hours and hours and probably thousands of dollars to establish their brand. And that brand is communicated through the font style they use, the colors they use, the logo design. They want to communicate something to the world and they get a great thought. It's the same thing with us. We have to establish our brand. How do we want to be perceived? How do we want people to view us? And if you do not establish your brand, if you don't figure it out, Everyone else is going to brand you anyway. And they're going to brand you as you're all over the place. You don't know what you want. You don't know who you are. You know, you look different all the time. Or, you know, your brand is a bad attitude. Your brand is always showing up late for work. I mean, whatever it is, if we don't self-lead and say, this is what I want to portray. This is what I want to project. I want to project confidence. I want to project that I'm professional, that I can articulate. And I can, you know, really command some effect in the office. Um, so you have to, first of all, think about how do you want to be perceived? Because that's the reality people live with. Then you have to think about how do I portray that in my outer image? Yes, it is about your outer image. Um, do you give thought in the morning when you wake up and get dressed for work? Or do you dress on how you felt when you rolled out of bed this morning? which if you live in the Midwest, which I used to do for a long time, sometimes on a cold, snowy, wintry morning, you just want to throw <laughs> things that are warm and fuzzy and all of that, but you're going out into the workplace. So, again, you get that thought of how do I want to be perceived? And then how do I want to, you know, how do I visually portray that? So now that comes through in leading myself and selecting the clothing that I want, the glasses I want to wear, the shoes that I wear, especially for women. Men, it's so much easier for you guys. You know, you don't have so many options. I think about, you don't have to think about the jewelry they wear. Even. And what is that? So I establish a brand. And like I said, if every single day, um, and this has been proven, if every single day a, 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 an assistant looks different, all the time, complete extreme with wardrobe. You know, one day it's blue jeans, one day it's capris, one day it's a suit, one day it's um, slacks. It sends a message that you don't know who you are. Interesting, right? Um, mm -hmm. We also then have to establish our brand. And so other parts of our brand are, if you want to be poised, you want to be articulate. Part of your brand, oh, I have a great example. If you were to ask me what Jasmine's brand is, the number one thing I would say to you immediately is her calm. She has been with me for seven years, and we have been through some of the most ultimate times. But my husband battling pancreatic cancer and passing away three years ago, it has not been easy for her to be here. And Jasmine is always calm, always. And she has four children. She does all kinds of things outside of work. So you see, that's part of her brand. That's how I would describe her in addition to many other things. So for our audience, for those of you who are out there as assistants, I cannot tell you enough how important it is to establish a professional brand. And something else I'm going to tell you, um, and, you know, I'm always open and honest with assistants. I give you the view from both sides. And so as assistants, yes, We've come a long way. You've come a long way. But you know what? We're still fighting a battle. We're still fighting to be taken seriously in the workplace. So if you wear anything or do anything that diminishes that, you're making it it's harder for all of us to rise up. 
I mean, that's what we want in this profession, to be taken seriously, to be seen as business partners. So each and every one of us has to think about what we do, what we say, how we dress, how we interact. So we uplift the entire profession, not only ourselves. And also assistance. 97% of administrative professionals are female. And I hate to say it, but women are still fighting to be taken seriously in the workplace. So that's just the reality. We have to think about how we look, how we act. And that goes back to, I've got to lead myself. I can't follow the crowd and what everyone else is doing at work. Because you know what? They could be going in the wrong direction. That's great. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, so one more thing about you know, being a self-leader, and specifically in the business world, right? Uh, you know, businesses exist to serve customers and as an admin professional your primary customer is your exit right so so how should admins and assistants really go about uh, building a strategic partnership with their executives um, and and how do the self leadership uh, principles help in that angle oh this is excellent to uh delete um, because I see this all the time, especially in my, the one-on-one -on -one coaching work I do. Um, and again, from being an assistant and being on the other side of the desk as an executive, I expect my assistant to take the lead, not always wait for me. But in building that strategic partnership, one is to get engaged in the scope of your executive's work. And this is not having anything to do with uh, the scope, meaning the kinds of meetings your executive set up and that they have travel and that type of thing. The scope is much bigger. Uh, so an example for me is people might say, the scope of my work is that um, I do training, I specialize in training assistance, I write books. That's not the scope. That's how I achieve my scope. The scope of my work is to improve the quality of work life for administrative professionals. The scope of my work is to have this profession seen as a vital, valuable profession. The scope of my work is to get organizations and managers to see that they have to invest in this group of professionals. Now, how I reach my scope is through this. Um, another part of my scope as an example is that when any assistant comes to our conference, or our world-class assistants or programs here in Las Vegas, I want them to feel like a VIP. Now, if Jasmine and Michelle, who works in our office, understand that is my scope, now they will think about everything they can do to make our visitors feel like a VIP. So you have to understand the scope of what your executive does. Another thing assistants need to take the lead on is, um, this is straightforward. You've got to get your executives to have one-on-one -on -one time with you. And I see it all the time. Oh, my executive is so busy. I don't dare interrupt my executive. Oh, I can't ask my executive to have daily huddles with me. You know what? You have to do this because I know for a fact after 42 years, those face-to-face, one-on-one conversations are critically important to your success, to your productivity, um, the list goes on and on. So that's another place you take the lead. And you self-lead by asking that executive to maybe meet with you once a week if they're not in the habit of doing that. And you talk to them about why this is important, what you would cover when you meet with each other, so they don't feel like it's a waste of time either. And then you lead them into meeting with you two days a week and three days a week. Um, if you're going to have that strategic partnership, you have to get inside their heads. You have to think like your executive thinks. Well, you have to ask questions. You have to learn how your executive thinks. And you also have to do what I call executive speak. I love the language of executives. Um, for, since I was 19 years old and worked in offices, I listened to the words executives use. And I mirror those words. And that's why I think I was so successful when I worked with my executives, because I mirrored their language. I said it back to them. They'll use words like flawless execution. They love to say, let's get in the game. Well, if you want to build that rapport and have that synergy, mirror the language that you can be accepted. Um, building a strategic partnership does take time. And so you have to be patient. Uh, a way you self-lead to is to um, 
take things off your executive plate. Don't wait till they delegate to you. Don't wait till they ask you. You know, go in there and initiate it or say to your executive, um, I see you're working on this project. If you, and this is, I, I, know, I want to give you another example. Sorry. I think this is a better example. When I was an assistant, one of my key executives had a monthly report that he had to generate, and it took time because he had to pull together statistics and get numbers from the various departments for our organization. So I asked uh, John one day, was the executive, saying, I told him, I said, you teach me where to get these numbers, John. I can do this report for you every month, and I will save you 12 hours. Now, what could you do with 12 hours? That would be better use of your time than working on this report. So even though John had to sit with me for maybe a half hour, teach me how to do the report, he gained 11 and a half hours. What executive doesn't want that, right? So as an assistant, stick your nose in there. And, and, and also what's great about that is you're building your skill set. You're going to become more marketable. You always want to be adding to your bag of skills. So those are a few ideas, Billy. That's great. So uh, I want to put you on a spot now. So, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> you talked about some really great principles, and you know, you also talked about some really good things about Jasmine. And uh, you know, a lot of uh, audience have been commenting that you know they'd love to hear from Jasmine too, right? <laughs> so shall we try and see if we can bring her online and see if she can share? you know, how she's been applying some of these principles in her daily life, and, you know, what are some of the results? Uh, yes, I think she's around somewhere, so let's, yes, yeah, please do. Uh, I next, love can you, can you try to bring Jasmine online? Okay, it looks like uh, video is... Uh, She's coming. There she is. Hi, everybody. Wow. Hi, <laughs> Hello. Hello. Great thing about you from Joan, and uh, we want to hear live from you in terms of how you are applying these uh, self-leadership principles in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Joan, for saying the things that you did say about me. I've been getting a lot of great replies on the chat side of the um, webinar <laughs> here, and I'm just really honored that you appreciate our partnership. Um, and for me, yeah, Joan did mention that I have four kids and um, my husband is very patient and supportive of all my interests and passions. Um, I am the advisory council chair for the Vegas Young Professionals here in our community. And I'm also a PR director for an organization called the Cupcake Girls. And I volunteer a lot at my church. And there's, you know, the list goes on um, of some things that I'm involved in. So I would say one of the things that um, my tips for just juggling all of that is to be selective about what you do. It seems like I do a lot and I say yes to everything, but I really don't. Um, I pick the things that are um, important to me, that I see that I could make a difference um, if I get involved and that I can use my skill set in a unique way within that organization and really help them accomplish their mission. So I'm very selective in picking um, things that I'm passionate about and that are important to me. And uh, another thing that I, I believe you need to do is um, be cautious of what you're saying yes to and what you're saying no to. Um, Jones also in, in past videos talked about how I, I take on challenges from her and, and, and I'll say yes, but I, I like to be selective about what my yes is to. And if I feel like the reason I'm thinking about saying no is because the idea of whatever it is scares me, I've never done it before, um, then I know I probably should say yes because it's an opportunity for growth and to challenge myself. So. I think just looking at what you're saying yes and no to and really weighing it, like why am I saying no? Am I saying no because it's a little bit scary? Or am I saying no because it just doesn't align with who I am? It's not congruent with my brand. It's not congruent with who um, I want to be. And uh, because of all of those things, I do need a, a pretty sturdy network of support people. And I mentioned my husband, Dave. He's always there um, just to, to help me out. And we do a tag team thing. If he's got something going on at work where he needs to spend some extra hours, 
Um, I, you know, hold, I, I taper things back a little bit on my end so that I can really be the extra support system at home and he does the same for me. And uh, I think you just need to have people like that all around you, you know, in your work life, in your home life, in your friendships, people that believe in you, people that inspire you. So I look to a lot of women in the community that I see just doing a lot of things as well. So I don't feel like the only one that's doing it. And I want to, you know, I want to know how they're doing it successfully as well. And, you know, they say that you become the average of the five people that you hang out with. So I really try and surround myself with the kinds of people um, that I want to be like, that I want people to see me as. So um, that's what I would say, you know, some, some of my top tips for really being able to juggle it all. Um, it's just, you know, when you're doing something that you're passionate about, it doesn't really feel like you're doing um, a big chore. It just feels like you're, you're living life and you're enjoying life. So I don't really feel like I'm doing a million things. Like some people may look at my schedule and think that I am, but I'm just loving all of it. Um, and I mentioned your, your brand, and I know that's another thing that I'm um, able to talk about in the Mastering Self-Leadership Program. And uh, I get to talk about the career portfolio, but the extension of your career portfolio, and how you can take your brand out digitally. Uh, I think a lot of people are starting to explore that world where Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook are and, and everything else is popping up. And um, it's been out there for a while, so some people are a little more skilled at it than others. Others are finally, you know, checking it out. But um, I would suggest you have a digital brand it's, it's because it's an extension of yourself. And Joe mentioned earlier that even if you don't think you have a brand, you have a brand. The same thing goes for online and your digital personality. So you want it to be just that congruent extension of yourself. So if you have a Twitter page, being cognizant of what the background is, what it looks like, what it's saying about you, but what also are you saying to your audience, to whoever decides to follow you or look you up or um, just interact with you? Or what kinds of things are you talking about on your Facebook page? Are you um, talking negatively about a lot of things? Or are you talking positively? Um, are you saying things that are going to make you um, be seen as a thought leader? So really being aware of what you're putting out there because that is your brand. Um, and other, you know, other quick tips on that are I've seen a lot of assistants starting their own blog. And that definitely shows that their skill set and that they're a thought leader in their industry and as an administrative professional. Um, it's getting them recognition, and they're they're being published in administrative assistant magazines like Executive Secretary because their writing is right there on display, and it makes them um, easy to access. So uh, those are just a few quick tips. I have a ton more. I can talk about digital brand and social media all day long, but I know Joe has more to say, so sure. I'll dial it back. Sure. But sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. <laughs> I have uh, one more question to you, Jasmine. Um, oh, okay. You seem to be very lucky. You're support, surrounded by, you know, a great support system. You have a great husband, and you have an awesome boss, you know, who believes in the same principles and who practices the same principles. Now, how about someone out there, you know, who may not have that awesome boss, and how should they go about building a strategic partnership? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so. They, they may just not um, be connecting with their boss or if they haven't gotten to that partnership level yet. Um, and sometimes you do just work with somebody that's really difficult to work with. So I would say just kind of um, observe that person. Really try and figure out, you know, how do they communicate? What kinds of things um, really seem to spark their interest? And I think by observing and um, really trying to understand the person that you're working with, you can kind of adapt yourself. And I think that it's, uh, flexibility and adaptability and assistance and emotional intelligence is huge, and, and that helps you connect with somebody so much easier. And I would just start educating yourself on how to connect with people, how to connect with anyone, and um, be flexible in that relationship so that you can I think by understanding who you're working with, you'll be able to do things that are going to satisfy them at that work level um, and ask the right questions of that person. Great. So, Joan, would you like to add uh, some thoughts to that? You know, like specifically when you have a difficult boss or someone who's not necessarily at the same frequency, how do you really 
deal with such a situation and how do you go about building the department? Oh, that's that is great and it's true. Not everyone is going to achieve a strategic partnership. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's about, I'd say, 25% of assistant executive teams achieve the pinnacle. But you could get really close to it. So that's the good news. But what happens if you're not clicking? Um, so one thing, you may not really click with this person. I actually left the few jobs when I was an assistant because I realized even after a few weeks that as good as that interview went, as great as they made that job sound, I realized our styles were really different and our philosophies about work were very different. And I left because I felt like my life is too precious. I'm at work 40 hours a week. Um, and so I had to find that right spot. However, not everyone could just up and leave their job. And I hear that often from assistants who say, this is the best employer in town, it's the biggest company, I'm blessed to be here, but boy, my executive is really difficult. So uh, one thing to think about is why we sometimes think someone is difficult is because they think differently than we do. They might have a very unique communication style, very different from our own style. So we're, we're thinking, oh, they're so difficult. They're not really difficult. They're just being who they are, just like you're being who you are, and I am who I am. So, but, but you have to work together, so you have to have some degree of appreciation. Um, one thing I think is always worth having a, a conversation with that executive. It's worth, again, exploring more about them. Um, figure out specifically what is it that's creating the difficulty in your relationship with this manager. Does it have to do with communication, that you're not getting the information you need, you don't get the direction you need? That's something you can talk about with that executive. You can sit down and have that conversation. I feel like the reason why I don't always meet your expectations, Mr. Executive, is because I'm not maybe really understanding, you know, how it's being communicated to me. And I really want to meet those needs. So what can we do to maybe help improve our communications with each other? Does it have to do with you feel like your executive doesn't even care about your personal life? They don't even know that you have kids, maybe. There are some executives who are like that. So if that really bothers you, you know, what do you want to do about it? Can you do anything about it? Um, and I'll give you a little side note here. Uh, there was an executive I worked for in 1985, top, top executive, wonderful person, but he never had an assistant who made him feel like they had a partnership. She often let that executive down. She didn't follow through, whatever the reason. I came along, I had been an assistant 17 years already by that time. I knew how to build relationships. You know what, it took me one year to build a great relationship with that executive. I had to teach him that if I opened up, eventually he opened up. If I showed him I would never ever let him down, he would delegate more work to me. So it's almost like what you want to see in that relationship, start living it, start doing it. Sometimes we have to teach that executive how to work with us, how to operate with us. So first of all, you give it everything you've got to help make the relationship work. Now, again, you have to think about if the personalities, if your value systems are different, does the executive ask you to lie on his or her behalf and you don't like that? So you've got to think about that. Is it the communication style? Um, what is it? So then you can actually start to think of the solution and be creative. Then, if months have passed, all else fails, and it really is not working out, and it is creating turmoil in your life, I hate to say it, but sometimes you have to make the decision to find something else that is better suited to you because life is too short to sure. be unhappy and carry stress that then affects your home life. So mm -hmm. first you give it every chance you have. And again, this is where you lead. You take the leadership and bring that relationship into what you like it to be. Don't wait for them to do it, because they don't even know half the time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Great. So, uh, so I think you mentioned to me, John, that uh, you are conducting trainings at four cities, two day trainings, uh, about self-leadership later this year. So can you talk about, you know, what you plan to do during those two days in these programs and, you know, how are you going to train and uh, make all the admins self-leaders? 
Oh, I'm very, I'm very, very excited about this because, uh, Delise, I don't go on the road that often in that respect. 90% of my work is on-site training at a specific company's location. I think it's been about seven years since I actually went on the road and had public workshops. So we're going to go to four cities this year. Jasmine's going to come with me. We piloted this program last summer with 150 administrative professionals. In two full days, we covered 10 main topics. Um, we are moving fast. We dig deep. Uh, it's experiential. So one of the things, for example, that we have this, in this two-day um, event, mega training event, is the assistants get to put together a draft career portfolio. So we actually have binders there for them. We let them use their creativity, have fun, start to put this portfolio together. What would you put in this portfolio? What would your mission statement be that you would add into the portfolio? So it's very hands-on in all 10, like I said, all 10 topics we're going to discuss uh, more on the strategic partnership, the self-management we're going to do a deep dive on. Um, we're also talking about peer synergy, collaboration with assistance is a huge topic today with organizations. Um, so what we do in this two-day mega training event, as I said, is going to be very specific. I provide tools and techniques that are proven methods that work that will actually change that assistant's life and walk them through. And we'll keep reiterating this idea of how do you really do this from that mental perspective, that mindset, because it's more of a mindset than a skill set. When you develop the mindset in all of these 10 areas, the skill set, then you can add to that, and then the actions will follow. So we're very excited. We're going to be in uh, let's see, San Jose, Atlanta, Chicago, and Columbus, Ohio this year. Uh, we'll be in San Jose actually in March. It's our first time. Jasmine is coming with me. I am very excited because she's going to add what she knows. And I love it because Jasmine, you know, has that the younger generation perspective. So I have, you know, the 42 years of experience out there and a lot. I know how much they can change and, and have uh, greater depth to their life. And Jazz is wonderful because she brings in, you know, that younger, I hate to say that younger generation perspective, but it's true. That's what she does. And she's very savvy in so many different areas, like how to do the digital portfolio. Um, and she's great. So we're going to go together. We're going to go out there. We want to impact lives. We want to meet these assistants. We want to, you know, energize them. We want to um, connect with them. We want to just be there and help them in any way we can to learn how to self-lead so that they could really start to, you know, experience all these wonderful benefits. Sure. So, Jasmine, would you like to add any insights as well in terms of, uh, you know, what uh, you plan to accomplish from these training programs? Sure. Well, I guess it's, it's exciting for me because I actually get to go on the road with Joan, and that's the first. Um, but really, I love to connect with people and just being able to be out there and reach our audience and talk to assistants in different cities um, and make those connections is really exciting for me. I know just talking with a lot of the assistants on Twitter and Facebook and on Office Pal as well, um, it's been really great. And I think just being able to go and see people face to face and give them a big hug is going to be probably one of the most exciting parts of the whole thing for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, are you? Uh, do you have any early bird discount or any specific discount for maybe yeah. some of the attendees? <laughs> We do. Right now, the event is $100 off for all of the cities. Um, on February 25th, the San Jose event will go up to $6.99. So right now is the best time to purchase. And we're at the Hilton San Jose. Um, mm -hmm. So we're really um, looking forward to it. Great. And if they want to learn more about this, they should they go and check out? OfficeDynamics.com. The event's there on our website, and it's in our, our store, our shopping cart. Um, but they'll be able to see there's a banner on the home page directing them to the Mastering Self-Leadership Program. Great. Okay, so, so let me go over a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so, Joan, one of the questions is, how do you tell your boss uh, when, you're, when they're asking you to do something that you simply don't want to do? and find demeaning, <laughs> like washing their dirty dishes. 
I go above and beyond and be told as much, but this is too far. So how do you deal with this situation? Um, open dialogue is critically important. And I know those are sometimes hard conversations to have, but you need to have them and, and have that conversation. So you want to think about the words for instead of going to say. So instead of saying, I'm not doing those dirty dishes, that's way beyond what you, you know, this job is required. They're going to get really defensive at you and say, well, who do you think you are, you know? Uh, what you need to say is, I feel, because nobody can argue with your feelings. So if you say, I feel that, you know, this responsibility of having to clean the dirty dishes is not really accessing and utilizing all the talent that I have to offer you. And that my time would be much better spent on da 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 da. Or you could say, you know, I feel that this is actually a request that is above and beyond my job duty responsibilities. Um, and really express how you feel again, thinking about the words that you would use. And then wait, like be, you have to be quiet, which is really hard because you want to keep talking, but don't. And hear what their feedback says, or hear what their feedback is. Now they might say, well, you know, we're just sorry. You are the only one in the office who can do this. We don't have a service. We don't have anyone else. In fact, when I was an assistant, and I worked at um, Boatman's Bank in Memphis, Tennessee, and I worked for the CEO. And we had a private little dining area and a private little kitchen with a dishwasher. I had to put those glasses in the dishwasher. There wasn't a service that did that. And I worked for the CEO of this, you know, this bank there. And um, I thought, all right, well, if that's what I need to do, that's what I need to do. I don't feel that I'm the maid because I have so many other large responsibilities. There is no one else who can do this. It's part of what I have to do. But if there's something I would I feel really uncomfortable with, you know, then I would have that conversation and look for alternatives. And maybe before you actually talk to that executive, come up with some answers, have some solutions ready. You can say, so here's what I recommend. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Or I've looked into a service and it's only going to cost us X amount a month. I mean, and think about why are they asking you that? Is it because there is no one else who can do it? Is it because there is not a budget to bring in a service? So kind of get behind it first. Then you want to express your feelings and how you, you know, how you see it outside your realm. Again, think about the words you're going to say so your executive is open to you. And then try to have some solutions. What do you suggest then? Because uh, that's what I would think, all right? So what, what do you suggest? But you definitely have to talk about them. And that's where when you have that strategic partnership, you can have that dialogue. But it has to start somewhere, so this would be a good time to start that. And if they, um, one other thing I want to add, if that executive says, well, you know, that's just too bad, that's the way it is, then you have to weigh the pros and the cons in the big picture of all the benefits you have, in the big picture of what you like about your job, is it worth leaving that job? And you might say, well, no, because I love 80% of my job. No job is perfect. Even for me, there's always stuff, even when you're on your own business, there's things you're not going to like to do. But you weigh that. Now, if you say, well, no, there's only 50% of my job I'd like, and I really don't care about the other 50%, then again, maybe you need to think about where you're working and what you're doing. Right. So, uh, so John, so one of the things you talk about is, uh, you know, you emphasize on the value of collaboration, right, with your uh, coworkers and uh, with other admin professionals. So, so sometimes one of the big challenges while collaborating is that you have to deal with I know it all people, right? Uh, you know, we can become across with those. So, so one of the questions from the audience is, how do you deal with these I know it all people? Oh, so I just love those people. I call them the Edward or Edna experts of the workplace. They think they know everything. One thing is, I feel sorry for these people, uh, sincerely, because usually people who are secure don't have to come across as an expert. People who act like they know everything are actually very insecure human beings. And where I used to get mad at these people, once I understood that premise, that disappeared. 
It was more of empathy for them. I have sympathy for them. You can also go think about maybe the language that you would use with this person because sometimes they're really annoying and they drive you crazy. <laughs> so you could say something like if I had Edward Expert, as I call him in my training, um, I'd say, Edward, you know, I'm just amazed how you know so much about everything. How do you learn all that information? And say with a big smile on your face. Um, if it's in a group setting or, or maybe there's two or three of you around and Edward's there, you could say, um, Edward, you know, I, we love hearing your ideas. We appreciate all your great input. Why don't we give Mary a chance to talk and let us know what she can share with us. Uh, let Mary talk and share her ideas about it. So if you want to just develop good communication skills with the know-it-all. So if you have that assistant where I said to know it all, just step back. Remember, first of all, she's insecure or he's insecure. Now think about how you want to talk with them. And if they're giving you input and saying, well, this is how you do this, and this is how you have to do that, just say, you know, Jim, I really appreciate your, your expertise. I appreciate. So first acknowledge. Acknowledge. You appreciate the input. You appreciate your advice. And I also want to discover some of this on my own. Um, and don't use the word but. That will negate everything. So if I say, I really appreciate your expertise, I appreciate the fact that you've been in existence for 30 years, and I also want to do some of my own exploration. I also test some of my own ideas. I also did, and I did some research on that topic, and actually statistics say that 80% of da da da. So you want to use the language, don't back down, you know, you be that leader, be that self-leader, it's developing the right communication skills so that you are still coming across in a very professional format and are kind of getting the message that you're just not going to back down all the time they show their expertise. Right. So, so the next question from the audience, Jordan, is, uh, you know, are some of these principles uh, valid and applicable for virtual assistants as well? Yes. Um, in fact, all the skills I teach, you know, other than meeting face to face with your executive or in their office, are, are applicable for virtual assistants. And I think it is that is actually critically important, more important, that a virtual assistant have outstanding communication skills in your emails, in your, I mean, because that's really what you have. I mean, if you're connecting through email, and actually, I have a big virtual team. I have people all over the country that are part of the office dynamic team. And so your communication skills are critically important, being clear in your emails, clarifying your expectations, letting people know exactly what you need. You have to take a little more time to explain yourself. And if you are virtual, I really encourage that you you save time as often as you can, pick up the phone, because that gives you that opportunity when you talk to each other, just like we're talking right now, we can clarify what we think, you know, we heard, or we could clarify, you know, what we're saying to those individuals. So, yes, yeah, critically important. Right. So, uh, so, so one of the challenges of becoming self-leader is also, so, you know, specifically, you don't want to come out as being too pushy, right? You know, specifically with, the, with your boss or some of their deputies, you don't want to be intimidating. So how would one, uh, you know, make sure they maintain that balance? That's very good. Thank you for that question. Yeah, that's a question uh, because, of the audience. Right. We, we don't ever want to come across being aggressive or abrasive. So it's often in our tone of voice. We have to pay attention to our tone. So I could be assertive and very firm with someone and yet I have a big smile on my face and I think about the tone of voice that I'm going to use with each other uh, over that individual. And if you present it in a way that I care so much about your success as my executive, I want to do everything in my power to make your life easier. And here's a suggestion I have. Most executives are not going to say, oh, no, I don't want you to make my life easier. Ah, I love all this stress. So, again, thinking about letting them know that you have their best interests in mind, that you're watching their back. You are going to protect them. You are going to make their life easier. And here's how I can do that for you. 
So it isn't so much about, well, me, 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 and this is, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm going to dive in there. It's more because I care. And I know as an assistant for so many years, I did care about my executives, and I wanted to do whatever I could to take things off their plate and make their lives easier. So expressing it in that format, um, again, like I said, let's think about the words that you're going to use, um, how you say it, watch your tone of voice, your body language, your posture, make sure you have a smile, uh, look into that, their eyes when you're talking to them, so it's, it's the whole package. Right. So, uh, so Joan, uh, you know, over your career, I'm sure you've interacted with several uh, admin assistants and trained admin assistants who really mastered this art of self leadership and and you know who stay on top of their game. So, what are some of the top defining attributes that you see? I have seen some outstanding assistants who take the lead. Um, what I see in them is they have excellent communication skills. They're articulate. They take the time to explain themselves. Um, they take action. They don't just talk about you know what they want to do or how they're going to lead. They really take action in it. So an example, uh, a woman that comes to my mind, uh, there's a couple actually. The one that comes to my mind, for example, she was determined to bring my star achievement training curriculum into her corporation. We did not believe in bringing in training and investing money for their assistance for years, for decades. She is sharp, she's bright, she did her due diligence. She pulled all the facts together about my program and what it is going to do for their company and how it was going to help their executives. So by developing their assistance, this is how it's gonna help us. This is the investment. She got it down to per person cost. You know, she did her research. She had all this information, but she was very factual. She was a very good communicator. She laid it all out in writing. She also presented it um, live, you know, in a live presentation. She had a PowerPoint slide. Uh, she articulated again what she needed. She presented it very well. Um, she wouldn't take no for an answer when you know when they first started to put up their hands. Well, then, well, we don't know. We're not sure. We've never done this for years. She kept saying, and, "But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it." And here's why. And so she was she was assertive. She didn't give up. That's a big trait of self leaders. They don't give up. Um, and I was the same way when I was an assistant. Just because I got a no doesn't mean I turned around and gave up. I thought, okay, how do I persuade you? So that's when your persuasion skills come into play. And she persuaded this organization, and now I've been teaching my star achievement series there for a few years, and it's been very successful. Management has noticed. They want assistance now um, who have gone through my program. When their top executives are interviewing for positions, they want the assistance who have gone through star achievement. So do you see that she kept that persistence? What else do they do? Um, they build very strong networks. So every single day they are building their inner circle. They connect with everyone, very friendly to everyone, uh, always thinking about what could I do for someone else? Because what happens then when you build these great relationships, and I mean you're really connecting with people and you really care about them, they're going to want to be there for you when you need something done. So that's another thing they do. Um, they put in, they really put in the time. They put in the dedication. If they have to take an hour at night to work on something to do what they want, uh, make something happen, they, they'll do that. You know, they're not afraid to do that. Um, they'll try to get another great thing with these leaders is they'll try to find out who the champions are in the leadership team. So they also try to build a very strong bond with high level executives in the organization who can help move their cause forward. Um, they'll initiate and start uh, projects or things that will actually help administrative professionals. And then they'll give the organization those to see the value and the benefits. So they're always talking about the value, the benefit of something. They're, they're tough skin. Um, like I said, they don't back down if they feel really confident that what they're suggesting is going to be good for their manager, their department, or their organization overall. 
So those are a few of the, the qualities. Um, and again, they brand themselves very professionally so that people take them seriously. That's another part I think that goes back to the branding. If you don't look professional and like you command respect, that's the reality that other people live with. So just even changing your wardrobe to command more respect. Right. So, so the next question is on the job market. Uh, many administrative positions were cut during the economic slowdown a few years ago. Are you seeing an uptick in administrative opportunities? Can you repeat? I'm sorry, the first part of the question that we I couldn't hear. Yeah, so many admin positions were cut during the economic slowdown a few oh, years ago. Okay. Are you seeing an uptick in the uh, job market? That's, um, uh, yes, that's true. Administrative positions have been cut. Um, I'm, I'm feeling good about it because I read a statistic from the um, Labor Department. And um, they're predicting by 2020, the administrative profession is going to increase by about 450,000 people. So where, you know, we thought of it as a dying breed and people think, oh, systems are going to just disappear someday. Now we have proof that there isn't as more companies. Um, well, first of all, the economy overall is starting to get much better this year. There's a lot of optimism about it. We're seeing it here in Las Vegas. It's amazing the growth that is creating jobs this year. So exciting for us. But that's happening all around the country. So, of course, as business booms and the economy is getting better, there's going to be a need to fulfill those positions. I also see what happens in organizations where they cut really lean for the assistance and they'll have one assistant supporting 30 people in the department. They realize after a while, this doesn't work, the, the work isn't getting done, the quality of work is suffering, and then they'll go back and say, I think we need to add another administrative person to this area. So um, I, my question is, I'm optimistic about the future. It is not a dying breed. You know, it, but dying is the way we operate. But yes, I feel very good, and companies are starting to make that turn this year. Right. So, uh, so the next question is uh, one specific area in which I need to become better self leader is time management. Projects take more time than they should, but I have trouble with good enough. How do you get past stumbling blocks like that? Well, that tells me this is a person who cares about her work. Mm -hmm. um, because feeling like she doesn't have enough time and wanting to do it right, and so. We, I teach excellence. I, you know, that, that's what we live, eat, and breathe at Office Dynamics. Everything we do is about excellence and quality. You also have to get to a point where you say enough is enough because you have to move on. Um, and so as you're putting together your quality product, whatever that is, or, or output, you also have to look and, and say, okay, this is, is, a, this is at a great point, and now I need to stop, and I need to move on to something else. For your time management, here are some really simple basic tips that they are powerful. You need to ask questions such as what I am doing right now or what I've been asked to do, does this impact the bottom line? Does this add value? Assistants are busy with a lot of busy work. All of us are, not just assistants, all of us. And so we have to start to self-lead and making decisions about what is critically important um, and I know you are just overwhelmed. I know it. Uh, so again, you have to come back and say, this particular task or what I've been asked to do, what's the impact if I don't complete it today? What's the impact if I let this sit for a week? So don't ask, oh, I, do I need to get this done today? Ask, what's the impact if I don't do this today? And think about the domino effect. Then you need to really sit and prioritize, like I said, what is critically important to move things forward either for your executive, if it's something that impacts a customer or client, you've got to think about that. So throughout the whole day, you're having to lead yourself in making those decisions throughout your entire day. And just because things are thrown at you, don't stop what you're doing. I see this all the time when I sit one-on-one -on -one with the system. And I've been with over, I don't know, 50 different ones on-site one-on-one. And what I see happen is they're busy working on something that is important, 
their executive comes up and asks for something, or they get an interruption with an email or a phone call, they stop what they're doing and they do that other thing, but it's not important. So you have to, you know, take ownership, take that lead, even though things, uh, people are pushing work at you and delegating and telling you they need this and they need that you need to say, is this more important? And what I'm working on right now, keep your focus. That's the other big word, stay focused. It isn't about managing time, it's managing ourselves. It's managing ourselves from jumping every time an email comes in our, e -box, our um, inbox to look at it. How many times do we all do that? We see that email pop up and we're like, oh, I've got to see what that is, who that is, what they want. You're distracted. So better manage your time, you have to manage yourself. You have to ask questions and then make those good decisions. Sure. So, yeah, so we are almost uh, 15 minutes past our time, and I know <laughs> several of them have to get back uh, to work and lunch. There are a bunch of questions about uh, uh, the uh, e-portfolio. So, you know, perhaps uh, we'll work with John and Jasmine to share more information about the e-portfolio and perhaps some samples and things like that via uh, office file. So stay tuned. And then, you know, there are a bunch of questions about a certificate of attendance for this webinar. Um, you know, please send in your requests to support at officefile.com over the next week or two, you know, we'll try to, uh, you know, verify that uh, you have attended the full session and then, uh, you know, we can send across uh, certificates confirming your attendance. So I think, uh, you know, rest of the questions will probably take them offline. Uh, you know, we'll, if, if there are any other important questions, we'll share them with John and have them answer or, or you know, we'll take them up via office pal. So, uh, and, and also, you know, we'll be uh, uh, recording this session and uh, we'll be sharing the weekly uh, via Office Pal uh, sometime next week. So, so please feel free to uh, check it out and share it with your coworkers and uh, other people in your network as well. So, so Joan and Jasmine, thank you very much for your time. It's a great pleasure to have you join us today. And uh, on behalf of the Office Pal team, I'd like to thank you and your team for, your, for all the incredible support uh, that you've uh, provided in helping put this together. It was definitely a great pleasure to work uh, with both of you and your team, and uh, would love to collaborate on more initiatives with you in future. And, you know, would love to continue to have you both engage on officefile.com and share tips and advice with the community members. Yeah, Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, Thank, thank you very much. I have to have one quick little second here. I forgot to mention um, when we went that two-day mega training event, they not only get a certificate of completion, but if they work through some other projects with us, they will actually get certification in self-leadership. So if that's really yeah. important to them, we're going to offer that. But thank you so very much. As always, it's wonderful being with you, and thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, so thanks everyone for joining this webinar. And in case some of you haven't yet joined Oxfile.com, please do sign up now. Uh, it's a great opportunity to connect and collaborate with thousands of admin professionals and thought leaders from around the world. And uh, we have our next webinar planned for FAC 26 with Julie Perrine uh, on uh, getting job descriptions right. Uh, if some of you have attended our previous webinar with Lucy Brazier, uh, you know, we talked about uh, uh, IOTSA, right? 2014 is the year of, uh, the, it's the international year of the secretary and the administrative assistant. And one of the key parts of IOTSA charter is getting your job descriptions right. And Julie has been working on putting together some templates on this, and she'll be sharing all the tips and tricks to help you get this right. So we posted brief information on this on OfficePal this morning, uh, so you can go there and check it out. And stay tuned to OfficePal for more information. So, so until our next webinar, bye for now. Bye. Bye, John. Bye, Jack. Bye.